Welcome to our webinar as part of the Australian Pollinator Week uh, series. We've got um, a, a three speakers for you today, with all of them from South Australia. So Andy Austin, Remco Lice, and Katja Hogendorn. So I'll be interviewing, uh, I'll be introducing each of those to you in a moment. The topic tonight is discovering bees, the art and science of naming new species in Australia, which is something that is very close to Wean Bee Foundation's heart. We've been a supporter of the Discover Bees campaign and Discover Bees program for the last couple of years. And it's something that is so, so important and can't be under, under um, stated, over, can't be overstated. So look, I'm looking forward to hearing from all the speakers that tonight. Um, it'll be about an hour, so a really quick session to get through a lot. Uh, to start with, I'd like to acknowledge the original custodians of the land where I'm coming from today. I'm coming to you from southwest Victoria, which is Gulagin country. Um, so I uh, acknowledge the original custodians of the land um, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd encourage you from wherever you're coming from tonight uh, to just chat, it, put down the chat where you're coming to. So we've got a bit of a sense of where everyone's coming from. Uh, we've got close to 100 people that have registered for this event. And from what I can see, they were from all, all over Australia. So really keen to hear where you're coming um, to uh, joining us from tonight. So our first speaker, Andy is a longstanding professor at Adelaide University, and he retired in 2021, but maintains an active uh, research program. Uh, for his research, Andy's been awarded a number of awards, the Verco Medal for Scientific Research by the Royal Society of South Australia, the inaugural Faculty Sciences um, Distinguished Research Excellent Award, a Whit Whiteley Award uh, by the Royal Zoological Society of New South Wales, and the Distinguished Research Award by the Australian Society of Systematics, uh, Systematic Biologists. Biologists. Uh, and he's mentored uh, 60 honours and PhD students and described over 560 new species of Australian insects. So Andy, welcome and really looking forward. I'll hand over to you to start the, the process to tell us all about, about taxonomy and why it's so important. Good evening, everyone. And Fiona, thanks for, uh, for the introduction. So um, my... Um, aim in this podcast is really to introduce you to um, Taxonomy Australia and explain what that is and to talk about some things leading up to Discovery Bees. So after I retired a couple of years ago, um, I still do quite a lot of research, but I also took on this role as Director of Taxonomy Australia. And so um, firstly, what I do want to do is um, look on behalf of myself and um, Remco and Katja, um, all of us live in Ghana country, which is the Adelaide Plains and Hills. And so we acknowledge the um, um, the traditional owners of this country and, and we um, pay our respects um, to elders, both past and, um, and present. Um, so th uh, what I want to cover in this talk is firstly to explain what Taxonomy Australia is, I want to then sort of in a very broad brush and quite a fairly brief way, um, talk about the diversity of the Australian biota, our plants, animals and other organisms. Um, what the scope of the taxonomic problem is in trying to describe that biota and leading on to that to um, introduce the discovery, uh, the Discover Bees project and how that, that sort of fits in. So in 2016-17, the Australian Academy of Science um, launched a decadal plan focused on the biosystematics of the Australian biota. And so it's a, a plan, a decadal plan over 10 years, and it seeks to use new and emerging technologies to develop key infrastructure and create a sort of a unified and dynamic science that will serve the needs of society, government, industry, and so on. And so as part of that decadal plan, Taxonomy Australia um, was formed, and it's really an overarching sort of entity or organisation that represents the whole of the taxonomic research community in Australia. And so it has um, a number of roles, which include, um, you know, 
fostering science, helping to train new and emerging young scientists and an advocacy role in raising the awareness of taxonomy um, as a science and to help provide a sort of solid financial framework uh, for it. So there's five elements that sort of are key to the decadal plan. And so um, the first and probably the most significant one is to accelerate species discovery and documentation using new and emerging technologies. To help do that, it needs to help integrate and enhance taxonomic infrastructure, and that's to facilitate the best practice in biological collections, um, which are very much distributed around the country, to support you know, the growth in taxonomic capacity, and that's really about training young scientists, importantly, to enhance the services for end users, which are utilising those, uh, those new technologies for data management and, and sort of enhanced diagnostic tools, that is to make it easier for people to identify insects, both professional biologists and members of the general public, and to engage the community, including Indigenous Australia, in helping to document the biota and recognise its uniqueness and its value to Australia, both in an inherent way and also from an economic point of view. Synthesising all of those five elements, the overall mission of Taxonomy Australia is to document the biota, describe all species within a generation. And that, when you think about it, is a massive task because it's taken us 200 years to, to really describe a relatively small proportion of the biota. So the challenge is a, a huge one. One of the things that the Decadal Plan did with Deloitte's Access Economics, which is an international organisation that does economic forecasting, modelling, um, provides advisory services to help clients sort of plan their future, both in terms of their organisational structures and financial framework to help with major decisions and navigate the complexities of sort of, you know, an economic policy into the future. So the Australian Academy of Science commissioned um, Deloitte's to look at the benefits of taxonomy to Australia. And these four lines are watered down from what is a 60-page document. But essentially, for every dollar that Australia invests in taxonomy, the description and documentation of species brings an economic benefit of between 4 and $35. It's a good investment for the country because um, it impinges and contributes to better biosecurity outcomes in agriculture, fisheries, environmental assessment, conservation, and a whole range of, of other activities. M moving on, what I want to do is really summarise what we know about the diversity of the Australian biota. And so this pie diagram breaks down the number of species within each of the major groups of organisms in Australia. And about between 900 and 1,000 species are described by taxonomic scientists every year for the continent. The highest proportion by a long way are insects going around the wheel anti-clockwise, arachnids, you know, spiders, scorpions, mites, crustaceans, fungi, vascular plants, um, and a range of, of other groups. But that's the described fauna. There's about 160,000 described species in Australia. And that represents, we think, about 30% of what the true size of the Australian biota is, which is estimated at about 530,000 species. And so this pie chart is slightly adjusted to, to that estimated numbers. And then the percentage numbers are the percentage of species from the left-hand pie diagram which are currently described. So we estimate that only about 25% of insects in Australia have a name, only about 15% of fungi, but about 85% of flowering plants are described and better than 90% of all vertebrates, mammals, birds, reptiles, fish. Taking those numbers in, it provides a sort of a snapshot picture of the task ahead of us in terms of what we need to do. The task of describing 70% of all species in Australia in a, in a generation, it's a task which is huge and it can't be done using sort of current technologies and approaches. It's an aspirational um, endeavour, but one where 
we think the application of modern technologies can can really come to the to the fore and accelerate the description of species. It's estimated that we would need to increase or accelerate species description by about 10 to 16 fold. So that's going from 900 species, you know, to, you know, nine to, to sort of 15,000 species a year. Quite some years ago, a colleague of mine in Australia, Quentin Wheeler, tried to break all of that down on a global basis. And he put together what he called a species scape. And it was, it's a really lovely way of visually showing the relative diversity of groups of organisms on a planet. So this is done for the whole planet, not Australia, but the proportion of the images there, you know, would not be any different from Australia. So the, the proportional size of each of these images represents the total number of described species, not estimated species, but described species. So thinking back to that pie diagram, you know, by far the insects are the largest group of animals on the planet and hence the very, very large beetle. Fungi are um, much, much larger than, you know, you might expect, but the huge numbers of species yet to be described. And then the mite on the left-hand side represents the arachnids. The snail in the middle there represents mollusks and fish. The mammals are uh, represented by the little elephant underneath the toadstool and so on. This is a picture which is based on described species. And so if we extrapolate that to what the estimated size or diversity of each group of organisms is, whether it's on a global scale or for Australia, that beetle needs to be in the order of 10 times larger than it currently represented there, which would make the image really unbalanced. But it makes the point, I think, really clearly. And this is a diagram that gets used in undergraduate lectures around Australia and globally to make this point. So Taxonomy Australia challenge is to describe Australian species within a generation. And the way that that needs to be done is really adopting and putting into practice those five dot points under the decadal plan. And clearly that involves using new technologies, certainly technologies from rapid molecular biology, but also advances in imaging, in robotics, and a whole range of other things. The impact of artificial intelligence in this space is difficult to assess, but it's undoubtedly going to play a role. So one of the things that Taxonomy Australia did is it's set up two or three projects as really case studies to launch the idea of the rapid description of elements of the Australian biota. And the first cab off the rank in that regard is Discover Bees. So I don't need, I'm sure, to explain to this audience that bees are really one of the most iconic groups of insects. They're critical for pollination as key ecosystem services in terms of the pollination of plants and shaping plant communities. It's estimated there's about two and a half thousand species of solitary native bees in Australia. Keeping in mind that virtually all bees are solitary, the social bees, such as the honeybee and the bumblebee, which were introduced into Australia, and a small number of native bees, which you can almost count on your fingers, um, social bees represent a tiny proportion of the, of the total estimated fauna of the bee fauna of Australia. It's thought there's about 1,500 species which are described and have a name. Some of them are not identifiable, even though they have a name. There's approximately a thousand species of bees that are undescribed. And that's the challenge for the bee taxonomists in Australia. And that includes Remco and Catcher. And so, Fiona, um, I think that's the point at which I'm going to um, leave this and hand um, back to you. Thanks, Andy. And I'll just remind everybody. Um, so as you as we're listening to the speakers, please add your questions, any questions that you've got to the Q&A, and I'll um, have great pleasure in introducing Remco. So Remco, our second speaker, is a research associate at the South Australian Museum, and Remco works mostly on the taxonomy of Australian native bees. Remco did his PhD on the evolution of the world's carpenter bees, and he's been working on the taxonomy and systematics of Australian native bees for about 25 years. And he's described close to 150 new species. So welcome, Remco. Thank you, Fiona, for my uh, introduction. So I will um, talk about the um, uh, 
uh, how you find new species and, and describe them. So first, of, co of course, you need to have uh, some specimens that are um, that that um, you get out of out of the field or out uh, of museum accessions. Uh, you try to identify them in case. If you're successful, then you're out of the circle. If you don't know what it is, then it may be a new species, and then you can start describing and name it. And then making an um, identification key is important, and you're de depositing types of the museum collection as well. And I, when that's all done, you, you publicize the, uh, uh, the new findings, and then the circle uh, is around. Yeah, and he said there was about a thousand uh, species still to be described, so that means you need to, uh, to circle uh, or to go around this circle for a thousand times. Uh, if you go in, into the field um, to collect uh, specimens, um, there's uh, several ways to do that. So uh, most often, we, if, if you're talking about bees, uh, we have a sort of a butterfly or a bee net and you sweep flowers or you hunt individual bees. Uh, you can have a, a net with a really long uh, handle, so to um, to sweep uh, canopies of uh, flowering uh, uh, eucalypts. There's quite an often uh, bees are sort of uh, gathered there around. But we also have been using a large net on top of the car. So if you drive from one side to the other, that net will, will uh, capture lots of insects, including bees. And then the, the insects are sort of... Uh, um, uh, collected in this little bag at the end, which you can zip off and then take your specimens. And of course, when you, um, you can see those people um, sort of getting insects out of a, a net, they are then later um, sort of pinned and then they will be uh, ready for identification if, the, if they are properly labeled. So lots of those um, surface that, uh, surveys that we did are in remote uh, locations uh, because um, uh, that's uh, basically areas where we know much less of, but you can even find new species just in ur urban areas. The other possibility is that if you go in a museum, there's uh, accessions of unidentified specimens. So if you look into those things, you know, it's quite often that you uh, can find uh, new species as well. Yes, yeah, so you have got your specimens, you bring those to a laboratory, you start um, identifying um, the specimens, if you can, if there's if there's an identification case, and then you identify them to all different levels. And quite often, if you're at the genus level and there's a, a nice key to the species, if you can identify it to the species, then 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 you're happy. And and sometimes you it doesn't fit, and then you may have new species. And so, if you um, identify species, you need to carefully um, compare that with named species in museum collections, uh, especially type specimens. A type specimens is actually a the specimen where a certain species is described from, and that specimen is the uh, the reference for. You can always uh, go back to that species and compare it, so that's very important. So what you also can do is uh, uh, generate a DNA barcode from your specimen by taking off a, a part of a, a leg or something, and then uh, when you've got a, that DNA fragment, you can compare that with a DNA reference databases. Those reference databases are kind of a project in the making. In Europe, the reference database for bees are almost complete. In Australia, we, we managed to have about a thousand species from the, the 1700 uh, species that are now known. So if you do, don't find any match, then you possibly have a new species. So the process here is uh, you try to associ associate males and females because uh, lots of species, the males and females do not look alike. So if you an ex example of the green carpenter bee here, so the male uh, on the top and the female here um, are, are very different. So early researchers or taxonomists may have described them under different names. And so you can as associate males and females by uh, running DNA, because then uh, that tells you whether you've got the same species. If you're lucky, you can find a mating pair, for instance. But yeah, quite often, uh, associate males and females is difficult, um, yeah, and, and, and not always people get it right. 
Once you're happy with your choice, you choose a rep representative of each sex, which are sort of then used for uh, making a general description. So those represent representatives will be then be the type specimens for future references. So you create uh, uh, general descriptions, uh, but you also study the intraspecific variation. So that is the variation within the species. Uh, and that is important to do that because quite often uh, it, it, there should not be over, an overlap in variation with an artist. Uh, then you also choose uh, diagnostic uh, characters and describe how this species uh, using those diagnostic characters differ from related species. And of course, in a good publication with descriptions, uh, you will have illustrations with, uh, like, like line drawings and photos. So you, you can see here a, um, an image plate of a description of new species where uh, we tried to, to get some uh, diagnostic characters, like in, in this case, the front legs of the male and um, some more other things. And then the last thing is that you need to find a name. So quite often, um, and we prefer uh, the name a species of after a diagnostic character because then uh, it is quite clear. So if your specimen has um, got red legs, while well, all the other species in 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 the group have uh, uh, black legs, then you, you you call it the the red legged one. But uh, often you can um, name uh, species also after the the collector. Or after the yeah, the collection site or the the place where the specimen was found, or a benefactor, and then to make um, it easier for other people to uh, identify the species, uh, to uh, uh, make a identification key. So in the past, usually those keys were dichotomous keys, and you can see an example here, and that is basically you get an option of two different characters. In this first couplet is. Is your specimen a male or is your specimen a female? And then you direct it to the next couplet and then you come to um, a species name. Another way, and that's our interactive keys. Those keys uh, do not have the, uh, the two options to uh, choose from, but you can have a whole range of different characters that you can choose from. In, in this case, you have a, a number of boxes that you can click, or it looks most like this. And when you click that from the original 10 species, it shows you how many species are still remaining, and that suggests uh, other characters to look at. So you can basically find your own structures on, on the characters that you can see. The really good thing of those keys is that it, it tells you the species you've got here is not in the key. And you, you don't find that in the dichotomous keys. And especially if you're not uh, used to using those keys, you think, oh, my species should be in there. And then you may choose the wrong species, the wrong name. So interactive keys are, uh, are quite good. Okay, so the next stage is actually uh, the, the type specimens in a museum collection, because that is the, the safest place where, uh, for future reference. And you can also submit uh, the DNA barcode to the molecular database. And on this image, it shows you how that, that they are stored in uh, most of the museums. So the, recs, the red boxes are uh, indicate uh, type specimens. And you can see here the male and the female of up to uh, blue band and bee species that we uh, collected. And they are in the South Australian Museum. So it's also good to, if you generate a barcode, that you submit those uh, to the molecular databases. So it could be the barcode of, li of life in, in Canada or uh, the uh, uh, gene bank uh, databases. So that gives other people um, uh, the um, opportunity to compare their uh, species or their barcodes. And then you submit a manuscript for publication in the scientific journal, and they are always uh, peer-reviewed. That means that two independent um, reviewers uh, go over and um, judge whether the manuscript is, is good for publication. And when you publish the, in the new species, the, they will be registered in, in zoological, zoological databases. So in Australia, we've got the Australian Faunal Directory, where you can you find um, yeah, so the whole um, systematic and taxonomy of Australian fauna. And I think there will be also similar directories for, for plants and fungi. And of course, the, the names are also registered in ZooBank, which is an international uh, database. Okay, it's just in short, um, a project that I'm working on at the moment. So this is um, a project of uh, um, uh, resin pot bees. They are called um, 
resin pod bees because uh, the females make uh, little uh, brood cells from resin that they attach to a uh, twig. And uh, so each brood cell will be provisioned for a single uh, offspring. So when I started this project, there were 10 original names. But after looking uh, and comparing the specimens, it showed that only six names were valid because some species were just different species were described as male and female and they actually belong together. So when I, uh, I looked at all uh, specimens that I collected myself in, in the outback during lots of uh, different field trips, uh, but also from collections, uh, museum collections, I found 86 new species. And so in this case, it was quite easy to, to just, oh, this is a new species because there were only a small number of named species and the genus was actually quite well defined. So we barcoded 30% of the species and uh, submitted those to the uh, to databases. 16% of the species we were able to uh, associate the sexes using the DNA. But on the other hand, 64 species are only known from a single sex. So this could be a problem uh, in, in the future because it may be because males and females in those are not easily sort of combined because they look pretty uh, different. Uh, so it could be that, that I've described more species than actually there. But on the other hand, uh, the, uh, it also shows that we still, even from this group and so many new species, still don't know how many species there are. Because when, whenever you go in the field, you can actually find new ones. Yeah, so I designed a dichotomous uh, keys as well, interactive keys, you and Lucid, and this will be published uh, uh, hopefully within uh, uh, six months. Thank you. Wow, what a lot of work and what a lot of species. I can't believe that you went from 10 to describing 86 new species. So that's a, that's a huge amount of work. So the next speaker is Katja Holgendorn. Katja is a researcher of bees and crop pollination at the University of Adelaide. Um, and she was very concerned about bee declines and that led her to become very active in the area of bee conservation. Uh, Katja's work in taxonomy, species discovery and general bee biology and science communication is motivated by the fact that uh, we only protect threatened bee species if we know their existence and understand their environmental needs. So welcome Katja and look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you, Fiona. Keep your questions coming through, everybody. Remco already talked a little bit about naming a new species, but I'm going to uh, go in a bit more detail there. We'll start with Shakespeare. What's in the name? Well, what's in the name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And that's a citation of Shakespeare. And it's Juliet's line when she's telling Romeo that a name is not is is nothing but a name and hence um, a convention with no meaning behind it really but what she's talking about is not the name Romeo of course it's the name Montague because she is from Capulet and Montagues and Capulets have a feud and therefore uh, they are fighting well I'm not really talking about Shakespeare at all here I'm talking about the fact that most people around the world have a binomial convention of some sort of names, where part of it uh, identifies the individual and part of it identifies the group that this individual belongs to, such as a family. Aristotle started this in uh, long, long before, long ago, and he um, proposed a binomial definition where he identified Genos, genus, and ados. So kind and form. And it's exactly the same thing. It is a kind of animal to which kind of animal it belongs and what kind of form this individual animal species have. Such as he said, a kind of animal called a bird has feathers, a beak, wings, a hard shelled egg, and warm blood. Because he used lots of different aspects to classify the species. Hot blood, cold blood, mammals, for instance, cold blood, reptiles, and no blood that was insects, flying or not, living on water, etc., etc. It didn't lead to a good classification, and he wasn't con 
uh, uh, consistent with his binomial definitions of everything. And he lost himself a lot into finding the exact um, uh, uh, essence of species. But he did, uh, he was the first to suggest this genus and species uh, name. And in the Middle Ages, there were increasing explorations, discoveries of new species, and there were a wide range of classifications used. Species were described multiple times by different people. Of course, uh, we weren't communicating with the lightning speed that we were now. And so it was some sort of a mess and it became a very big mess until we got our Linnaeus. He was a very young naturalist. He was called as a boy, the little botanist, because he was collecting mainly plants uh, and identify them. Like many taxonomists, he became a physician first. He uh, collected and studied a lot of medical plants and described them. He went back to biology. And when he was only 28, he uh, proposed uh, a classification in a publication called Systema Naturae. Now, Systema Naturae uh, was a system for all animals and plants, and he described this hierarchically. He had kingdom, class, order, genus, and species. That's what he, he used. He made consistent use of this binomial system. He named about 12,000 species in his lifetime, and did many revisions of his Systema Naturae because he did all of a sudden discovered, for instance, that whales were mammals and uh, therefore they shouldn't be classified with fish. And that may have made a real difference, of course. Now and then you hear critique on his system. And one of the critiques are, well, it's based on morphology. You make these kind of mistakes. You will always make these kind of mistakes because you have convergent evolution of characters. Also, one of the comments was, yes, but he thought of species as fixed. Yeah, we hadn't arrived at Darwin yet. So this was not really a, a good critique, I think. I think what Linnaeus has done and the fact that we still use it is absolutely amazing. So Linnaeus created order from chaos. And we had the kingdom Animalia, the class insects, the order Hymenoptera, the genus Apis, and the species Mellifera, for instance, uh, which he described. Um, and later we added some levels. We added domain. Eukaryota, we added the phylum, Arthropoda, and a family, I believe, in this case, APD. So those were the, the levels that were added. But for the rest, this is still intact and still really useful to classify species in the different groups. So how do we then name a species? Well, we use Aristotle. We look for the genus and we look for the difference. And when you look at, uh, for instance, all the amygdalas that we have, what we uh, see here is that we have described some using their color. Uh, Kaaba, for instance, is ochre, and Viridis singulata is with green bands. But we have also named amygdalas to the place where they are found, Adelaide is in the, near the Adelaide River, uh, Mariensis is along the Murray and Peninsula is Cape York. So uh, that is another way of doing it. Then we name species after people, people that have done good things for taxonomy in general, or even benefactors that have paid for a trip uh, for discovery. And then there are a few left. Pulchra means beautiful. That was about one of the first ones described in that group. Singulata is a morphology. Indistincta was named by us because uh, Raymond hadn't picked it up and so he hadn't distinguished it. Alpha was a variety, earlier described as a variety of another species. So that can also be, history can come in there. And Asserta, um, I think, but I'm not sure, was done by Cockerell uh, because he was 
certain that this was distinct from pulchra. So that gives a bit of an overview. So color, place, people, morphology, history, and of course, in the case of many specialist bees that specialize on a certain plant species, we can also name them after the plants they are found on. Very often we try to do something with morphology because that gives the people that are trying to identify the specimen uh, a, a handle on, oh yes, that's, that character really stood out for me as well. That must be something, it must be something like that. Okay, so this is how we come up with names of species and then we Latinize them, or in some cases, we are, can also use Greek words. Um, we try not to mix the two, but uh, there's no hard and fast rules around that. So, finding names can occasionally be challenging. And Smith in 1853 described a whole heap of Australian bees and bees around the world. He was British, and he, for instance, described. Parastrachodus. He described this species from Australia, this species, this genus from Australia, because it looks like Strachodus. Now, Parastrachodus is a Lasioglossum, we know now, uh, but he described it as a genus. And Strachodus is also a bee, but it is a parasitic bee and it doesn't occur in Australia. So he said Parastrachodus, but then he said, but it also looks like. Halictus. Why? Because it's got the famous groove in the uh, last segment the females have, and because of the shape of the tongue, which is, um, or the labrum, which is quite distinctive in uh, Halictin bees. But he had all these species to describe. So what he did, he um, took a play with all the permutations of the word, word Halictus. And the, so he made numerous anagrams of halictus that mean absolutely nothing. And he uh, published these species. So of these species, some are not valid anymore, but the majority is still valid. And we have it. And it's no use searching for a meaning for these species names because there isn't one. OK, so uh, it can be difficult still to come up with new, more and more new names and people therefore name uh, often name uh, a species after their uh, children, their dog, you can do anything. So the question is, are there then no rules? Well, yeah, sort of. Um, there is the International Code for Zoological Nomenclature and they have stipulated that of course you cannot duplicate an already existing name for a species or former names for a species because that would lead to confusion and that, that's not contributing. They said well, names need to be Latinized. So the when it ends on ensis, that means that it is found in a certain place. For instance, Adelaide is of Adelaide. The male version is uh, with an I behind it. So um, Borkari, as we have seen. Uh, and they stipulate that names should not be likely to give offense. And of course, um, that uh, is however you play it. Uh, Linnaeus uh, named uh, a very badly stinking plant after a, bo a German botanist that he absolutely hated. So you can play with that as well. No use of intemperate language in debates about zoological nomenclature, but it then says in the rules that all of the above are a matter for the proper feelings and conscience of the individual zoologists and uh, uh, also of the editors and the uh, reviewers of papers. So there are rules, but they are not set in stone and they are definitely not policed very much. And the, um, uh, the international code actually says that they're not releasing it to that extent. The unwritten rule is also, but it, I couldn't find it written, 
is that authors do not name species after themselves. And I think that is a nice thing to, to keep as well. So I think it's uh, reasonable, all of it. And I, I actually love it. You're quite free in what you choose as species names. And there have been auctions of species names. And um, uh, for instance, there is an orange frog that is blind and that is named Trumpi. And that is very significant, uh, I think. Okay, finally, do we need to name species? We know that bees are important pollinators, but as I always say, even without that, they are beautiful and they deserve to be protected. And we cannot protect what we don't know about. The naming of a species is only the start of protecting it because after you've named, you want well, to obviously uh, study the species, know what it depends on in the landscape, what threatens it, if it's threatened, but without the species name, you, you wouldn't know where to start at all. So um, we need to discover and name our remaining 1,000 unknown bee species because otherwise we are nowhere near being able to protect them. So that's my contribution and I thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Katja. No pun intended of being here. Now, um, there was a great question from Clancy, and it's a good one to start with, I think. So Clancy says, I always hear the term 2,000 plus native bee species in Australia, and this is the first time hearing the 2,500. And Clancy wants to know where has this estimate come from versus the, um, the other ones. So Andy, perhaps it's a, a good opportunity for you to answer that one and explain how you come up with a figure. I mean, you talked, you talked in your presentation about there being 530,000 species across all the different um, fauna. And we're saying there's about two and a half thousand species of native bee in Australia. How do we come up with that figure? Look, it's a really good question. Um, and it's an, you're right, it's a nice one to start with. So I'm going to step back a little bit, not answer this for bees, but answer it for a, a much larger proportion of the of the biota. So some colleagues and I published a paper in sort of um, about 2004, which sort of chronicled um, what we thought were the best estimates for the size of terrestrial invertebrates in Australia and their diversity. And what was interesting about that if, if you go back through the scientific literature, in the 1970s, it was estimated that the Australian sort of um, fauna was in the, well, the Australian biota was in the vicinity of about 230,000 species. Well, and, and but at that stage, um, there were only slightly over 100,000 species described. If you come forward, um, 210,000 species doesn't look very much when there's 160,000 now described. And so there are no estimates for, for any groups of organisms that I've ever seen, either globally or for, or for Australia, where the estimates have gone backwards. They've always increased. And the reason for that is, is several fold. Um, and Remco touched on some of them sort of really eloquently, I think. Firstly, um, we use a whole range of modern collecting techniques that weren't used sort of in the 19 sort of 60s through to the 80s and even 90s. So new collecting techniques have allowed taxonomists to get um, access to collecting a proportion of the fauna that possibly wasn't ex sort of accessible. There's no doubt that DNA barcoding of specimens has revolutionized the recognition of species, but for many groups, and including some bees, um, is my understanding, is DNA barcodes have recognised what we refer to as cryptic species. That is, they're morphologically very, very similar to the point where they hardly have any diagnostic morphological characters. But the DNA barcodes are so different, they have to be different species. And so we have estimates about the proportion of um, the DNA barcode, which is different, that would indicate, you know, a new species. And that that threshold is different for different groups of organisms. But for many groups of insects, 
it's between sort of two and a half and five and a half, six percent. So if you get specimens with DNA barcodes greater than sort of five, it's a really strong indication that you've got different species. And so where the estimate comes from then is an extrapolation from all of those things. So rather than a hand-waving exercise, it's based on sort of objective assessments of um, the number of DNA barcodes um, that have um, come to the fore, extrapolations on the rate at which new species are described. So Remco's genus going from what a six valid species to 86 new species, you know, you're looking at a tenfold increase in the number of species from one revisionary study of one genus of bees. And you start multiplying that up. Um, so the, the number of 2,000 plus bee species, the plus is the hedge factor. And it's often used. I used it in my presentation. The advent of new technologies, in, in particular DNA sequencing, um, new collecting techniques and bringing sort of, you know, imaging on board to make them sort of identifiable. Thank you. And Remco, can you tell us, so that, that starting point, how many um, bee species are currently uh, described and named in the Australian Faunal di Directory? Yeah, it is at the moment. It's uh, 1,700, but that in um, some of those names may be syn synonym synonyms. Yeah. So it's sort of multiple names for the same species. So actually, when you start doing a revision and look at the tarps and ha having uh, sort of more informed information like the DNA barcodes, you may actually sort of ditch a number of names or put them together two to one. Yeah, so there, there's, ma there's many more. You could, uh, and, and one of the things I can add to what uh, Andy was saying, in, in, uh, there's all, also been a... A uh, program from the um, the federal uh, government. It's called Bush Bleach, that uh, brought um, uh, scientists uh, to um, uh, remote areas, uh, and that that Bush Bleach program is actually a species discovery program, and that was one is one of the reasons why we got so many uh, new bee species, but also a lots of other species. Um, there's another question here from um, Matt, and Matt asks, are DNA references made using type specimens or is that too destructive? Uh, does the DNA degrade from old type specimens? So could, um, I'm not sure, is that going to be for Remco or Andy? Look, I'll have a, I'll have a go at it because I've been doing this for a long time. When, when I first started sequencing um, insect specimens for taxonomic research, for a medium-sized insect, you would have to grind up the whole insect, and that was we were doing that in the late 1980s. And for tiny things, you had to have you know 15 or 20 specimens to grind up. And now um, the advent of a whole range of new technologies, and it's still progressing really rapidly, is even for tiny insects, you can use you know cut a tiny piece of leg off and amplify the DNA up, and it works really really well there's now you know a range of techniques and technologies for using um, and for accessing and sequencing dna from old museum specimens without going into the detail so it's really the technological advances that have happened in the last 20 years that are, are making this this possible and so previously we would have had to have sequence relatively fresh specimens recently collected from the fields that would have thought that specimens in museums that are you know 40 50 80 years old were inaccessible and that's not the case now and so for many studies and it depends on the group um yeah the ideally it, it's best to have a, a dna barcode um for the type specimen because there's then no measure of error you've got the dna sequence for the type reference specimen but there's a whole range of things that that play into that as to whether it's possible thanks andy um what about the cost of the actual process of naming bees i mean it's very remco showed a very in-depth process of the of the whole describing naming discovering that how expensive is that i had an attempt on um sort of costing um, how, how we sort of can describe the remaining bee species. And um, this was kind of a ballpark of about 
five million dollars. That was based on PhD uh, or postdoc uh, stipends and, um, and and researches. The problem is at the moment that the number of uh, people that know about taxonomy of bees are uh, very quickly uh, disappearing. Uh, so there's there uh, there's uh, only a small number of young young people. And um, yeah, so it would be really good to uh, yeah. If we if we really want to do this, we need to secure those young enthusiastic uh, people to to do to do the taxonomy work. So just on the back of the the envelope, if you say it's five million dollars, a thousand species, that's roughly five thousand dollars per species named, just as a rough estimate. Yeah. 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 But it needs to be said that to get young people to do taxonomy, they have to have a future. And so there need to be jobs in taxonomy. And that is really important. Sure. We've actually had a PhD student who's put a question in the chat. So it's a good good segue into um, the question f- uh, we've got here. Hi, I'm a PhD student studying threats to native bees in Cairns. I'm wondering what key resources uh, would you recommend for bee identification to species level? Are there any bee identification and are there any bee identification to genus species level courses or private training mentoring in Australia? So for about half of the species, a little bit more, there are keys. You have to be aware that not morphological keys, you have to be aware that not all species are in keys. Uh, for about 1,000 species, bins, not species, because we haven't allocated, there are barcodes available now, um, but we haven't been able to link all the barcodes to a species name yet. There are many undescribed species in that set. Toby Smith uh, in uh, Brisbane, he organizes uh, for uh, the University of Queensland a uh, bee identification course, uh, I believe, of a few days. And that is uh, um, so uh, get in touch with Toby if you want to do that. If I can give a, a Taxonomy Australia perspective on this as well. And one of the things that's really clear to how we how we do taxonomy in the future is we have to change we can't just keep doing things the way we've been doing. And so there's a whole area of research which is looking at using emerging technologies to more to more rapidly describe species. More than half bees, the bees in Australia have got a name and a fair proportion of them are identifiable. When you look at other groups of insects, less than 20% of them have a name. Um, and so when you're talking about um, describing hundreds and in some cases thousands of new species, you can't keep plodding away at that. It, it has to be done differently. And that means differently for every st- step of the of the process. And so moving away from, you know, four page, you know, textual descriptions of the morphology of a species and actually honing that right down to a paragraph along with the DNA barcode and possibly a nuclear gene sequence and publishing it rapidly. One of the things that Taxonomy Australia has done has launched its own taxonomic journal. It's the Australian Journal of Taxonomy, and it's a rapid publication outlet for getting species described and out there in the literature. So all of those things are happening simultaneously. I have a question. Can I ask a question as well? So yes. for bees, um, maybe more than for, for other types of insects, I think it is important that lay people can also identify them. But very often, these lay people don't have access to the molecular uh, facilities that are needed to identify that. So I, I totally agree that uh, we need those rapid molecular recognition, but we I think we need to also cater for um, the lay interested people. Those things are not sort of mutually exclusive. The sequence data, I think, is far more important in actually recognising new species and describing them. Making them identifiable is actually a different process which comes afterwards. And I agree completely that that needs to be done in a way which makes the fauna, you know, identifiable for 
you know, all components of society from professional scientists down to school children. Katja mentioned before the, you know, having a pipeline available for researchers, a research pipeline available for, for taxonomy to provide job opportunities. There is a question here, what is the job outlook for someone to do a post-grad training to become a taxonomist? Post-grad training is is not the barrier. It's postdoctoral positions afterwards. And so it, it's true, there are not very many taxonomic jobs, permanent jobs, but there are a lot of taxonomic researchers who are employed on soft money as postdocs and collection managers and um, in in various other ways. There has been a, um, a, a major review of um, taxonomy in Australia, and one of the recommendations to the federal government is for a very, very significant increase in the funding of taxonomic research in Australia, and that's been presented to the Minister for the Environment. You know, you'd have to say that the previous government wasn't particularly supportive, not just of taxonomy, but of many branches of science and budgets were cut in all sorts of directions. But And for the very first time, there are statements um, in government reports that are coming out, the State of the Environment Report made some very pointed comments about the need for taxonomy, the fact that it's under-resourced um, and the fact that it underpins everything. Those, those statements have not existed in those sorts of government documents for, well, ever in the past. So I think there's some light at the end of the tunnel. That's great. And certainly with the figures you were quoting early on, Andy, with for every dollar invested, it'll yield a return of between four and thirty five dollars that they're the sorts of um, figures that need to be uh, touted to yeah. show that this is, there is very strong investment and benefit yeah. from investment in, in this area. Um, look, I'm mindful of time. Um, there's a couple of things that I would just like to to mention. So, you know, we really do have an issue with being able to fund this taxonomic work. Um, we're, we're hopeful and we're trying to think that there'll be more government investment in this area that will provide more research opportunities um, in the long term. But there's a post here from um, Megan Halcroft saying that, that uh, she and some friends have produced a uh, calendar, lovely 2024 calendar with all proceeds going to the Discover Bees project, which is one way that we're um, helping to contribute to, or Megan and her, her team are uh, contributing to put some funds in this direction. Um, the Wean Bee Foundation also on its website collects donations specifically for the Discover Bees campaign, and all of those funds go towards supporting taxonomic uh, uh, work, the sole science of discovery. Uh, I'd also, uh, I'm really excited to let you know that um, we are about, we're very, very soon to launch B-Bay, which will be an online auction uh, uh, forum where people can actually bid to uh, have the naming rights to name a bee species. Uh, and this is something that we've been working on for a while. So we're looking forward to uh, launching that. It'll, it'll be launched in early, early in the new year. So stay tuned for that. If you're not already on the Wean Bee Foundation uh, newsletter, um, then please do uh, subscribe and we'll certainly let you know when Bee Bay is live. And we would welcome anyone uh, participating and contributing to the whole Discover Bees uh, funding campaign to try and fund more taxonomy work. We've also got Australian Pollinator Week about to start and there's many, many um, webinars and events happening. So do go to the Australian Pollinator Week website and find another event. But just to before we close, I'll, I'll just do a, a quick whip around our speakers to see if there are any final words of encouragement of what you would encourage people to do. Katja, what are the final words that you'd like to say in relation to taxonomy? Support it, by all means, support it, because we need it. We need it to protect our species, and that is uh, where I'm coming from. Thank you. Remco, what would you like people to do to support taxonomy? Help collecting by um, uh, making a net and going into the field. Fantastic. And that probably is a good opportunity to promote Australian Pollinator Count coming up in um, in in the next couple of weeks during Australian Pollinator Week. So go out there, count pollinators. And if there's something you don't know, maybe you might discover a new species. 
Andy, any any final words? Wow. Um, look, I, I I just encourage people to just go to their computers at some stage and start Googling information on bees and other insects because there's a huge amount of information on native bees on a whole range of different sites and for insects in general, um, which can enthuse people and get them interested in entomology as a as a science and and in particular in, in sort of taxonomy. Thank you so much. Thanks to each of the speakers, to Katya, to Remco, to Andy. Really appreciate you spending your time um, this evening, uh, particularly as it's public holiday here in Victoria. I know it's not there. I hope for everybody your horse won, came home as a winner, um, and I hope you enjoy and engage in Australian Pollinator Week, and thanks very much, everyone, for attending. And thank you, Fiona, for organising this. No problems at all.